68, Psalm chapter 68, a lengthy psalm. <laughs> it's written by David, and so we had a, a short one in 67, only seven verses, and David made up for that. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, 67 wasn't actually David that we don't think, so I shouldn't attribute it to him. But uh, Psalm 68, it's a long one, and of course, it's, it amazes me, you know, usually the way I operate is I look at the psalm, try to figure out what the setting and the occasion for the writing is, because to me, having that background helps me to make application for our lives. Uh, and just so you know, I, I did my due diligence. I believe this is probably either from 2 Samuel chapter 5 or 2 Samuel chapter 6, either when David uh, became king in Jerusalem there after all the hardship or when he brought uh, the Ark of the Covenant back. One of those situations probably. Uh, but here's what God kind of struck me with. This is not a psalm about David. It's a psalm about God. And you say, isn't the whole Bible about God? Yes, but there's some psalms where, where we focus on the plight, we focus on the distress, we focus on the problem that, that somebody else is going through. Uh, but I noticed that six different Hebrew names for God were mentioned here in this psalm. And there's just so many activities and movements and uh, I put attributes even of God that... I thought, you know, maybe it's good, and we're going to have to go fast, and I mean that. I, I know sometimes I say, oh, i got to go fast. I, was, I preached an hour Sunday morning at, at my home church, and I was like, kept saying, we've got to hurry up, we've got to hurry up. But they don't have a clock in the back. It's like a screen, and then way the back crow's nest up there, there's a little clock that you can't really read. And I, I could have sworn the clock was not where it was, and then when I finished, I went, oh, my Lanta. Well, <laughs> there we go. But they, I guess Brother Destry preaches on average, about an hour plus every Sunday morning. I was like, well, so they're used to it at least. <laughs> That's why I had all the liberty. So I, I mean it. we got to go fast. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read. We're going to stand together and read just verse 35. And you say, well, that just seems, well, you're standing and it's a long passage. So let's stand for the reading of God's word. We'll read uh, chapter 68, verse number 35 of this psalm. And really, I think this is almost like a a culmination of everything that transpires. It's, it's not, but it kind of is like that. You can get a lot about God right here. So verse number 35, and we'll go through the rest of the psalm as we, as we move. O God, thou art terrible. Out of thy holy places, the God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you'd help us in the short time we have to... Uh, Traverse this longer psalm, uh, Lord, but really we just want to focus on what we can see of you. There's so many different ways. Uh, there's one interpretation, but the application is really endless with your word. And I really felt like what you laid on my heart was to just focus on your attributes tonight. And maybe that would remind us of the God that we serve, the God that we love, the Father we have, the Heavenly Father we have. And so help us to focus on those things. And uh, Lord, even um, to think on them on a daily basis and let that shape our lives the way you'd like it to. Uh, we love you, Lord. We're thankful for this. Be with me as I preach. Empty me of self, then with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I titled the message, Thinking About Him. Thinking About Him. And uh, if someone said, describe a person in like, I don't know, 15 to 20 attributes. That's a lot, isn't it? If, if, I, if I gave you that many attributes to describe anybody, if I had to describe myself, like if I were going to uh, post an article of myself describing myself, which I wouldn't do, that'd be a really weird thing to do. But if I was going to and somebody said, you could do 15 to 20 attributes, things about yourself, you, even if you never met me, you'd know a lot about me just by reading that. And in this psalm, I found 17, and I probably, if I would have spent more time, or had more time, I should say, uh, I could have found more, most likely. Uh, attributes of God, things about God that, although we do know God, I think we don't dwell on these aspects of Him, or at least some of them as much as we should. Uh, if I'm just going to be honest with you, in a lot of ways, God is kind of aloof to us. He's... You know, he's, yeah, he's God, he's up there, he's sovereign and doing all that he does, and we live our daily lives not really ever contemplating the fact that God is actively at work and doing things around us, and so, for the most part, uh, some of us, 
if we're honest, can go, even if we're reading our Bible, we can go a day or two, even if we've read our Bible, not really thinking about God and what he's doing. And if you can't, can't agree with that, then you're not walking the same Christian walk that I'm walking. Because I can be in my Bible every day, and I can, I can be studying for sermons and still neglect to think about the God that I serve, the God that is my Heavenly Father, the God that is my Savior, the God that sent His Son to die on the cross for my sins. I don't even really think about Him. And so I'm hoping, and, and I don't usually do this at the beginning, but I'm hoping that as we, we go through these, and we're going to have to go fast, uh, but I'm hoping that you can see the way that David thought is what made him a man after God's own heart. Does that make sense? Because he dwelled, he spent time, and that's why we've even preached messages about, hey, our cell phone's a big distraction, and there's other things in our life, big distractions, that are keeping us from dwelling on the things of God, and even God himself. And so as we go through these, I want you to think this. Do I think about all the ways that God is, is at work, and what he's doing in my life, like David did? And if I'm not, maybe that's a big problem. Now, maybe that's why the people around me aren't getting saved like I'd like them to. Maybe that's why... Um, the messages don't strike, every message doesn't strike my heart and smoke my heart and I hear God. Maybe, maybe that's why uh, my walk sometimes feels very uh, shallow and, and, and maybe that's why sometimes when I pray it doesn't really feel like I'm talking to anybody. I'm just talking to the, to the pew or to the chair or to the side of the bed, wherever I'm praying. It may be that I don't think about Him, I just think about what He can do for me. So let's look at them really quick, and I mean that. We're gonna, I, I, have like, I have like an A and a B small with each one, okay? We're going to actually start with verse 35. That's why we read it. And you say, well, that's the end. Well, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great thing about God. God is terrible. You say, what? Well, yeah, and we know this. Terrible here is meaning to be revered and feared. And listen to me. Anytime in the Bible anybody got a glimpse of God or, or got a real understanding of God, it was something that, that put fear in their hearts. Because they understood his power, they understood his majesty, they understood that he is, uh, the word I, that comes to mind, or words that come to mind, is awe-inspiring. I, I can't, Isaiah said, I can't, I can't look here, I can't be, I'm a man of unclean lips, I can't, I can't. Uh, just when uh, Peter, James, and John heard the voice of God, just heard the voice of God from heaven, they all fell on their face on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's why they were witnessing Jesus Christ in a, and a Shekinah glory state, they still fell down because they, anybody understands God is awe-inspiring. Sometimes we forget that God sits on His throne and He is awe-inspiring. No matter the circumstances in our country or in our world, the reality is God is on His throne. And no matter who becomes the next president of the United States, He's in control. And no matter if World War III breaks out, He's still in control because He is terrible. Well, I'm just, I'm really afraid about this. You ought to be afraid about God. Let, him, let the only fear that's in your heart be for Him. Because He's the only one that actually can do anything that's worth fearing. Number two, God, back to verse number one, is on the move. God is on the move. Look at verse number one. I actually have to turn back. So you almost read 69. Let God arise. Let His enemies be scattered. Let Him also that hate Him flee before Him. A couple of other verses here, just, just briefly. Because if you go through verses 4 through 18, you'll find God do, moving a lot. I'm going to just pick a few. Uh, verse number 7, O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people. Did you hear that? Wentest forth before. Verse 10, Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. Verse number 14, When the Almighty scattered kings. Here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to get right here. That, that even though there's times when we feel like God isn't doing anything or we question if God is doing anything, because listen, it, it's easy, isn't it? If you sit back, if you let CNN or you let Fox News or you let ABC or NBC or, or, or Facebook or Twitter X, whatever it's called now, if you let any of those be the thing that you're focused on, what you'll come to the conclusion of is, is God not paying attention? Is God not like awake? We, we start sounding like Elijah taunting the, the, the prophets of Baal, don't we? Uh, maybe he's asleep. You might need to get louder to wake him up. Maybe he's off doing something else. And we get to this point where we go, is God doing anything? And, and listen, I need you to understand this about God, and I need to remember this about God, and we'd all do well to remember that God is constantly at work, yeah. even when we don't see it. My, uh, my kids don't always realize all that I do. By the way, Miss um, Dieta, I heard whoever else helped clean up and do meals and everything for Sunday. 
and t- took care of the mill, Miss Julie, and helped clean up all that y'all did. I appreciate it. I saw it today. I noticed because I was going to go down and start doing those things today. And I thought, man, hey, the dishes are done. The tables look in order enough, for, especially considering I'm going to have to move them off for Friday. I was like, praise the Lord. My kids don't under- always understand what I do. They don't see it. Sometimes they don't understand. They don't even, they really don't understand what I do when I come here. Why do you have to go to work again? <laughs> they think I just get up and make stuff up on Sunday mornings, I think. <laughs> Listen, we don't understand all that God's doing. He's at, he's at work in the hearts of people. He's at work in the nations. Listen, uh, we, we just mentioned Israel and all that can go on with Israel. And, and listen, he is at work with that. By the way, isn't it a weird thing that that is such a small place is under such attack for who owns it? And there's always conflict. Why? Well, because God's at work and people know it. And by the way, he's not, he's not just giving up on his people because our God's a covenant God. Amen. No, if he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to keep his word even if his people don't. Okay, we've got to move on. Number three, God is powerful. Verse number two. I love this. It's, what a great picture. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. He's talking about the enemies of God. As wax melteth before the fire. I think that's the picture I like the most. Like we, under, we, we can see smoke get, especially around here, moved by the wind, and it's like it, it just goes where the wind blows it. Uh, but man, that picture of the fervent heat and fire and power of God and all His enemies are like wax. We don't, they don't stand a chance. Uh, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Can I just remind you that God is powerful enough to handle all the situations in this world, even though they seem big to us? Satan's not winning despite what he wants you to believe. No, I know you can walk into somewhere like a boulder and go, this is a godless place. No, you could think that. I... I've seen YouTube videos where they're making fun of the way that CU students dress. I don't know why. Look how, look how liberal this place is. I'm like, well, what? But you know, there's this place called Boulder Valley Baptist Church. And, and God's reaching into a people that we would all look at and go, Woof, godless society. And God's saying, no, it's not godless. How will they hear without a preacher? So I called a preacher. And I had other churches send that preacher and support that preacher so he can go and do something and show that I'm not powerless and Satan isn't winning. And just because there seems to be more on the other side of uh, on the kingdom of darkness than the kingdom of light doesn't mean that I've lost anything or I don't have the power to change everything. He's powerful. Number three, verse, verse number three. Number, I'm sorry, number four and verse number three, God gives joy. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. What a contrast from verse 2. Where in verse 2, if you're an enemy of God, if you're, if you're one of the wicked, you really, I mean, you're not going to be able to stand in the presence of God. And one day, there is this thing called the great white throne judgment where they will be in fear and they will bow the knee and they will be scared and they will realize that how terrible our first point God is. But we don't have to be that way. Can I remind you, it's, it's been the theme of my Bible reading this year. We should be pretty joyful people. I, I, I refuse to let Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it or Facebook or the news or YouTube or anybody else try to convince me I'm on the losing side. That my God's not powerful enough or big enough or that He's not real or He would change this or that. No, no, no. God's good and He gives joy. Are you joyful? Are you as joyful as you should be? Number five, God is the only God. He is, I also put God alone. Look at verse number 4. We're going to read a couple other ones too, so stick with me. Sing unto God, sing praises to His name, extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name, Jah, I'll talk about that in just a second, and rejoice before Him. Verses 8 and 9. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Verse number 9. Uh, or I said, I said nine a second ago. That was, I, meant, I read eight, eight and nine. Sorry, this is nine. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance 
when it was weary. Uh, verse number 33 and 34, I have to flip a page for it, but it says this, To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty vo- and that a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel. His strength is in the clouds. Now that reference there to the clouds, it's, it's a subtle jab that we don't really understand anymore because Baal is not a, a God that is around, but we understand that Baal was a God that was around in these days. Of course, Elijah, the whole reason the, the challenge was to call fire down from heaven is because here's what Elijah knew. God, the only real God, he can call fire from anywhere. He doesn't need it manufactured. And David here is alluding to and almost making a subtle jab at all the other idols because they don't have any power to do what God does when it comes to the heavens. They don't change anything, whereas God can change all of it. But I also want to just real quick reference that name, Jah, uh, because he says it, and if it's in your Bible like it should be, it's the first name, uh, sorry, Jah, it means this, the self-existent or eternal Jehovah. You know what that means? He doesn't need anything else to exist. It, doesn't it bother, I always wonder, doesn't it bother idol worshipers that the thing that they worship, somebody had to make? And eat, listen, well, I don't worship man handmade idols, I worship the trees. And who made the trees? Are they going to say the Big Bang? I, I never know, like, where are they going to go with this? Because somebody had to make it, it's not, it didn't exist there all on its own. Well, I, I worship the sun. Who made it? God, God says, I, I'm God and God alone. Nothing, nobody and nothing is like me. And all the other lands and everybody else may, may try to ascribe uh, Godhood to something. I'm it. I'm it. And we would do well to help people understand. He's it. Uh, number six. God cares for the fatherless and the widows. This could have been two separate ones, of course, but I put them together for time's sake under verse number five. Verse number 5 says this, A father of the fatherless. Right there. What a, what a wonderful thought. Listen, if we're honest, most people, while they may be, have some sympathy for orphans, our thought is, I hope somebody else does something about that. Some of y'all, just, I'm not trying to say we're, 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 we're evil people. I just mean a commercial comes on and, hey, you can feed these orphans for X amount of dollars a month. And we think, I hope somebody else takes care of that. I hope somebody else will feed them. I hope somebody else will clothe them. I hope somebody else will take care of them. And, and listen, I'm not accusing anybody here of not loving people, but as far as I know, none of us have foster kids or kids in our home or taking care of kids or, or, or adopted orphans. Orphans are somebody else's problem for most of us. You realize God says, no, they're mine. I'll, father, I'll be the father to the fatherless. The ones that nobody else wants to worry about, the, the people that nobody else cares about, the people that somebody else will do something about, I'm their father. I'll take care of them. And then right there in the same in verse number 5, he says, and a judge of the widows. Now, that sounds almost bad, like well, he's judging the widows. No, here's what that means. He will see justice done for them. That's what that means. Be, uh, here's what one commentator said. He will save them from oppression and wrong. No persons are more liable to be oppressed and wrong than widows. And God says, oh, I'll take care of them too. Because under no fault of their own are they in the situation they're in. And I know widows today are in different positions than widows in biblical times. I understand that. Uh, our, our culture, of course, we have different um, uh, social services and social security and all those things that will take care of somebody that's a widow and there's ways that they can... Uh, be benefited, but in those days, widows were hopeless and helpless. They're, they're, the breadwinners of their families died, and, and I'm more thinking of widows indeed, as the Bible would call them, not so much widows that have sons and families that could take care of them. I just mean just somebody that had a husband, and he died, and she's all on her own. He says, oh, I'll take care of them too. Again, the people that everybody else sees and goes, I hope somebody else takes care of them. hope somebody else does something. By the way, Let me remind you, if you want to be like our God, if you want to try to be like His Son, if we're striving to be Christians, we ought to try to be not fathers necessarily to the fatherless, but show them the love of Christ, show the widows the love of Christ. We've got to move on. God loves the lonely. Look at verse number... uh, All right, let me finish. Uh, Verse 5. Is God in His holy habitation? Uh, Just reminding you, He dwells in the heavens. Verse number 6. 
And number seven of points, <laughs> there's a lot of them. We've got to hurry. God loves the lonely. It says there in verse six, God setteth the solitary in families. Uh, the solitary are those, those that are alone. And listen to me, there's a lot of people that just end up alone in our, in our society, and there's a lot of people that end up alone no, no matter where you are. And God's saying, you know what, I've got a place for them. Not only in his family, but I think in New Testament terms, today the best example would be a church family. You know, most anybody in our church, whether they have family to spend Thanksgiving with or not, you can have a Thanksgiving meal with us. Whether you have a, a family to spend a Christmas holiday with, you can spend Christmas with us. Uh, if you have nobody uh, that will acknowledge you on your birthday, by God's grace, we will. You know, we may not sing it to embarrass anybody. I know some of y'all enjoy that, but we'll acknowledge. You see what I'm saying? God says, hey, I've got a family for you. Someone to fellowship, someone to, to cry with you when there's things to cry about, someone to celebrate with you when there's things to celebrate, somebody to help you and hurt and, and, and in times of hurt. Number eight, God sets the captives free. Verse number six. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. For some reason, as I wrote that point, he sets the captives free. The song, He's Able, comes to mind. The kid's song, He's Able, He's you know, and uh, But it speaks of God. Actually, what, what David, is, David is referencing, and again, there's a lot we can get into here, but we don't, for time's sake, we won't. He's actually referencing when God delivered them out of Egypt. And you know that because once we get into verse 7 and 8, he's directly talking about how God... Uh, worked and so he's directly talking about bringing the Israelites who were in chains out of Egypt. But spirit, spiritually speaking, everyone in this room uh, has experienced the chains of our sinful nature falling off of us because of God, because He still sets the captives free. And by the way, He's still looking to set the captives free. No, He looks out on a society and where we're worried about all kinds of other things. The whole reason that the New Testament, uh, especially. Uh, post apostles times especially post acts there's not there's no miracles there's nothing like that going on you know why because god's not as concerned about physical he's concerned more about our spiritual i, I don't have time to get into it but man a lot of people focus on miracles in the bible and i've been, i don't know why god's been striking me with the thought there's not that many no there's really not that many there's little pockets of miracles throughout the bible and long periods with no miracles you know what that tells us god's not near as concerned about miracles He's concerned about souls. Okay, we've got to hurry. I keep saying that. Verse number 9. Or not, not verse number 9. Still verse 6, point number 9. God hangs the rebellious out to dry. <laughs> verse number 6 continues on. It says, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. I'll just remind you uh, that uh, the rebellious don't get all the blessings of God. For, for saved people, that's good, that's good application and reminder for us that sometimes we want all of God's blessing, but we don't want to do what he says. My kids want all of my, all the gifts that I can buy them, all the food and all the clothes and all of those things, and sometimes they want all that without wanting to listen. You know, I'll still feed them and put a roof over their head because that's my job, but all the other good things like the ice cream and the, and the fun and the games and the toys, that don't come if you're rebellious. And just a reminder, God, God handles rebellion. He takes it very seriously. Number 10, God guides His people. God guides His people. Verses 7 and 8 say this, O God, when Thou wentest forth before Thy people, when Thou didst march through the wilderness. Of course, uh, God didn't actually march. What a picture though. Uh, what He did was pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He guided them. And uh, verse number 8, The earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Now verse 22 and 24, real quick. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, uh, I will bring my people again from the, de from the depths of the sea. Oh, that was 20, yeah, okay, I'm good. That thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dog, dogs in the same. Th they have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. Here's what David was trying to get across to us. Uh, he, he's guiding us. Not only is he at move, he's, and we've already covered this, but he's at work and he's doing things behind the scenes, things that we can't see, but he's also trying to, every day, guide us. Now, obviously for them, it was evident. Pillar of fire at night, pillar of cloud. Really can't go wrong with that, can you? By the way, have you ever thought that they were still sinning with that big thing floating in the middle of them? Now, could you imagine that? 
Like as they're worshiping a golden calf, there's still this pillar of fire at night that's just like there. It's not like, it's not a bonfire that somebody built. It's like, it's there. I, I, I still, my brain sometimes have trouble wrapping itself around that. But uh, God is guiding us today now. Uh, he likes to guide us with the Word of God. That's what He's left us now. We don't need a pillar. In fact, we've got something better than a pillar. We have everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us a map. The reality is most of us choose not to open the map and look at the route. God provides, number 11, for His people, verses 9 and 10. Thou, O God, did send a plentiful rain, whereby Thou didst uh, confirm Thine inheritance when it was weary. The congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of Thy goodness for the poor. Listen to me, God, God took care of all their physical needs, He took care of all their spiritual needs, and He's still providing for people today. He knows your needs and He knows how to supply them. You may fail to accept His provision, but He will not fail to provide. So how do you fail to accept provision? Because sometimes God just gives you the ability to make the money. If you choose to be lazy, then that's your problem. Does that make sense? If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Well, I, I just... I just can't figure out. God doesn't supply for me. Are you standing? Can you walk? Can you work? Well, yeah. Then go work. <laughs> and it's amazing how that will take care of you. We don't have very many more. Or maybe we do. Did I skip one? <laughs> I tried to skip like three. I was like, hey, we're doing good. We're not doing good. Hurry. <laughs> Number 12. God rules over those that claim to rule. Verses 11 through 14. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Kings of armies did flee apace. And she that tarried at home divided the spoil. Though uh, ye have lain among the pots, ye shall be... And some of this is kind of figurative language. We're not going to get into all of it tonight for time's sake. Of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in, Sa in Salmon. Uh, here's the idea. Those that think they rule, the Almighty, by the way, that was another one of the names of God. The Almighty, should I? I think, how do you say that? Is it, should I? Is that how you say it? Should I? It's, I looked at the pronunciation and forgot what it said. Because <laughs> I'm a loser. Anyways, should I, Almighty? Yeah, those that think they're in power really are in power. Listen, it don't matter who the president is, prime ministers are, who kings are, who queens are, who leaders are, who rulers are. All those that think they're in charge, they're not actually in charge. Just a reminder, when he decides, it's all done. It's all done. Listen, when he decides rapture's happening, rapture's happening. When he decides to pour out judgment on mankind, judgment's coming down. When he decides to wipe out a third of mankind at any given point, it'll happen. When he decides to set up his kingdom and rule and reign, he'll do it. Because he is almighty. Well, I refuse to, I refuse to bow the knee. One day you're not going to have a choice. Uh, next, number 13, God chooses to dwell with us. Verses 15 and 16, the hill of God is as the hill of Bashan and high hill as the hill of Bashan. I said that two different ways. You can pick which one you like better. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill. This is the hill which God desired to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. Now, kind of lost on us, but the, the hills there mentioned in verse number 6, 15, they were a bigger mountain range with more peaks. And what David was saying is, y'all think y'all are awesome for that, but God dwells over here in Zion. This is his place. This is where he chooses to. Now, obviously, for Israel, he still chooses it. It's still his place. They're still his people. But spiritually speaking, God likes to dwell with us. Now we get him in our hearts, everywhere we go. Uh, unfortunately, we drag him into more situations that he'd rather not be a part of. Uh, but I just want to remind you, he'd like to dwell with you every day. He'd like to commune with you. He wants to spend time with you. He stands at the door and knocks. And I know that's more of a uh, for salvation thing, but that's on a daily basis. He's, he's trying to dwell with you. What a great God we have that doesn't... Listen, nobody else serves a God, a lowercase g, idol God, that wants to dwell with them. Do you understand that? Uh, when, when, when they're punishing them... Listen, in India right now, when they're hanging themselves from hooks or when they're crawling on their knees for miles to punish themselves... Listen, when, when people are still killing and murdering people... And, 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 and sacrificing people for God. They're not doing it because that God wants to dwell with them. They're doing it so that that God doesn't punish or hurt them. That's not God and that's not our, that's not our God. Uh, number, man, Roman numerals. Once I get it past about eight, we're, yeah, it's 14. 
God is the conqueror, verse 17 and 18. The chariots of God are 20,000, even, even thousands of angels. By the way, at any point, those are ready to go. Whoever needs them, whoever wants them. <laughs> we, well, God, how's it God ever going to... He don't need an army, but He's got one. Just David want to remind us, He's got one. A, a big one. Say, well, he's thousands of angels. There's millions in this army. I don't know about you, but if I'm a dude, I don't want to fight an angel. I don't know how many guys those can take on. I heard of one of them fighting, a, fighting Satan himself. If one can take Satan on, I'm not, I'm not in such great shape. Even thousands of angels, the Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for, uh, for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. He's a conqueror, and one day we're all going to find out. Mankind's going to stand against him. Satan himself, himself is going to try to raise an army against him, and it's all going to be for naught, because God is a conqueror. Almost done here. God is the God of salvation, verses 19 and 20. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. I love that. He loadeth. That's not, that's, that sounds like my kind of English. Man, God loads me down with blessings. Glad to know David was thinking on the way I think. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. He that is in our He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. Uh, David is of course speaking of deliverance for his people, how God has provided, but of course today we can we can dwell on how he delivers us. But let me remind you, he doesn't just deliver you from your initial need of salvation, you know, where you get salvation, you know, oh, I'm delivered. Yeah, but He can deliver us from all the other things that oppress us and bother us. Listen, uh, He can deliver you from any uh, mental problems you're having, from fear, depression, anxiety, etc. He can deliver you from financial problems, from marital problems, from uh, problems with your children, from familial problems, from whatever, you name it, he can, He's still the deliverer. We've got to hurry. And then uh, next, number 16, God is the God of victory. This goes along with God as the God of conquer, uh, a conqueror, but there is a difference. He doesn't just conquer. Uh, do you realize that God's never experienced defeat? Sometimes I, don't, I, I think I came to that thought for the first time today. God's never lost. Oh, I mean, when Adam fell, that wasn't a loss for God. That was a betrayal of mankind. That was mankind's failure. It wasn't a loss for God. Well, he had to send his son to die. Again, that wasn't a failure. That was an act of mercy. God doesn't know failure. Verses 21-31 through 31 is where I find this, so we're going to read this fast. But God shall wound the head of, the, of His enemies in the hairy scalp of uh, such as, as, and one as goeth on still in His trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring My people again from the depths of the sea. Thy foot uh, may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. They have seen the, uh, thy goings, O God, even the goings of My God. My king in the sanctuary, the singers went before the players on instruments. Uh, on, on instruments followed after. Among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is a little. Uh, there is little Benjamin with their ruler, the prince of Judah, and their council, and the princes of Zebulon and the princes of Naphtali. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, uh, that. That which thou hast wrought for us because of thy temple at Jerusalem, thy shall kings bring presents unto us. Rebuke the company of the spearmen, the multitude of the bulls with the calves of this people, till every one submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out their hands unto God. That was a lot there, but just really quick. Here's, here's simplified. This section of the psalm describes what the victory that God will bring looks like. It's the defeat of their enemy. It's their triumphant entry into Zion. They anticipate an even greater victory to come when it is all done. And we can one day look forward to a final victory. And I'm glad I have victory. I'm glad I have salvation today. But I look forward to the great victory where we live at perfect peace with Jesus Christ. New heaven, new earth. I look forward to that. But that, He's a God of victory. He doesn't lose. He doesn't lose. I sure don't feel that way. I'm telling you, He doesn't lose. <laughs> Lastly, God is is a God that deserves praise. Verses 32 through 35, the end of it, Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. That's everybody. O sing praises unto the Lord, Selah, to him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, 
He doth send out his voice, and that a, a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible out of the holy place, uh, thy holy place. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. He says all, all are going to praise him one day, but David says he's worthy of praise today. And we've talked about praise from other psalms, so we're going to wrap this up. And I know that was a lot, but that was 17 attributes of God, and they were all things he had done for Israel. But I think for most, for most of us, most of these are true in our lives. Maybe not the fatherless or the widow thing, or possibly it is for you there, but at least for me, those are the two that I, weren't necessarily true for me. Do you know God like David did? Can you describe him to people through your experiences of what he, is, what he has done and is doing for you? Have you dwelt on his attributes? If I ask you tonight to describe God from your experiences, what could you say? By the way, I don't think most any of us would come up with 17. If I, if I say, hey, give me the attributes of God. Give me some of the things he does from your experiences in your life. I don't know if most of us could come up with 17. And the reason why is we don't even think about them anymore. So I challenge you to start writing them out. Maybe in your prayer journal or your Bible reading journal if you have one of those. Why would I do that, Pastor? If you don't know what makes God so amazing, then how will you ever share it with others? My God's a God that provides. That's one that I could come up with easy. My God is a God that has delivered me. Salvation, you can come up with those. But you know there's so much more than that, and he's so much more than that. David paid attention to everything that God did for his nation historically and him personally so that he could describe God like he just did. Do you pay attention enough to what God is doing around you that you could do the same? I think most of us fail to think much of God at all in our day-to-day lives. And now, is it, it, and now is it a, it's a chance to change that. So, using my title, simple, start thinking of Him. Thinking of Him. Like when? Like when your brain's not thinking of anything else. What you choose to think of when you can think of whatever you choose to, that's who you are. That made sense. I don't know. Think on him. Write out every now and then. By the way, you may not have your journal with you all the time, but when you write things out, at least for me, it helps me remember them. Amen. So you'll write it out. Man, look how God provided. Look at how God was at work here behind the scenes and I didn't see it. Look how God moves. And all of a sudden, it might change. It might change everything about you. Because you are learning and paying attention more to what God is doing in you. Let's pray.